Everybody works at a different speed, but really mm. I've found over the years the better people you're working with, the more honest you are with them, the more kind they are to be able to help you. I think really good people tend to get quite a lot of their skills and power from mentoring other people. I think a lot of what is good, you know, old people, who successful people can go two routes. They can either help other people or they can become egotistical. There's only mm. two places you can go. And so you either sit back and rest on your laurels and go, look how many discs I've got, or you spend your time helping other people because then you learn from them. You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top five, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Beatbox created. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller podcast. This is it. This is the centre of bigness. Yeah, it's the centre of bigness. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Killer Podcast, live and direct, central London or central as you need to be. You know the coup. You know the deal. You know what we're trying to do here. It's the street culture, huh? it's sporting art. And uh, big shout out to Graffiti Kings. Hold tight, everyone, on the Television app. Uh, free download, you know the deal. Um, yeah, sporting art. And no one holds more medals in production across the generations. High level, ranging from Massive Attack, Sugar Babes, All Saints. Nana Cherry, Cameron McVeigh's side the place. <laughs> wow! Tell me about that. What being here? Tell me, oh. tell me about, tell me about how it feels to reflect on an introduction like that and then think, fuck. Well, I no, before that, <laughs> trust me, there's the one before. I was, the girl, I live kind of quite near Trellick, and on top of our garages, there's an allotment, you know, because that he was quite a clever guy, the guy. There. But a goldfinger, and um, oh, tight goldfinger, yes, yeah, proper man, yeah. but apparently a bit grumpy. But um, <laughs> but they uh, but the the um, the girl that runs the the allotment, she's great, and uh, we were sitting up there chatting, and uh, I was unloading the car, and she saw I had a disc for sales on a mat on madness is one step beyond album, which oh. I did the photograph for. So, what? Yeah, that's my photograph. Yo, legacy holding, come on. But the thing is, I gave her the disc, because I don't like to hold discs, and um, and I told her to ch- scrub out my name and put her name on it. So she sent me a photograph a little bit later on the phone, and it she'd written over the top of my name in pink, <laughs> Ruby. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, baby. She put it on the wall in her house. I was really proud. <laughs> I'll go with that. Okay. But before that, I used to be a fashion photographer. So, you know, in fact, I used to direct um, MTV before MTV Europe existed. Stop in a minute. Hold on. Mm. Look, see, look, this is what we're dealing with here. You know what I mean? Like, I feel, I mean, I've only known you for a small chapter of your life. It's a life of many lives, isn't it, essentially? And we bump into each other in strange places, as we just discussed before we came on air. Yeah, I know. No. It's almost like worlds are constantly uh, in a line, isn't Colliding. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah, 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 a nice yeah. way. I like it. Well, actually, the last time was actually in crossing big up Trellick Tower, hold tight. Um, just, uh, just cross right over on my phone. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, all day. Um, you were you were walking dogs, weren't you? And and with your Mabel's dogs. That's it. Hold tight, Mabel. Hold tight, Mabel. Of course. Big Mabel, just about to drop a record, which is huge. It's literally Dad sing along record. <laughs> <laughs> Certified. But yeah, before I did this, I was a photographer, and I used to um take pictures, and I got a bit, I did fashion, I worked for Vogue, did brides, worked at Condé Nast, assisted up at Vogue Studios, worked all over the world as an assistant, became a photographer. Then I started doing cheap commercials, which is called rostrum photography, which is basically okay. you take a load of stills and then they film them with a camera, so people who can't afford to shoot a commercial, they, and they run them in the old days. And I used to work for Goldbergs and Riggs, which is like Selfridges and Miss Selfridges in Glasgow. That rings bells, man. I saw it on BBC4, I'm, I'm an avid BBC4 watcher, man. There you go. So, that, mm. so basically Terence Donovan, who was one of the great three from the 60s Bailey Donovan and Duffy he was my producer really lovely man big up Dan Donovan who mm-hmm. used to be in big old Dynamite and a big, oh, hey, big hello. man from West mm-hmm. yeah see and uh, so Terence God rest his soul he was uh, my producer and he started me off doing that and then we directed commercials and then the MTV people came along via Miles Copeland who was um, Stuart Copeland the drummer in the police's brother and manager damn yeah Jeez. whose other brother was the head of the CIA no way. Yeah, little known facts. Really? Yeah. You know, we're going to have a bunch of little known facts coming over no, this lots, one today. Lots, lots. So it goes on. <laughs> so basically, Miles was doing the reports from London music scene. It was around about the time of Spandau Valley. We don't need no pressure on that time. Yeah, 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 and yeah, so yeah. me and my friend Jamie Morgan, big up Jamie Buffalo, um, we, we'd kind of just been basically running Buffalo, which is you know, Ray Petrie, the great Ray Petrie, 
myself and Jamie, we were the three original buffaloes. And uh, so Jamie and I were doing lots together. Jamie had basically taken my cameras and taken on my career when I decided I didn't want to take pictures anymore. And uh, we did, we ended up, Miles Copeland came to us because they wanted to they wanted some kids who knew about the music scene and we that we knew what we were doing kind mm-hmm. of thing. And he ran two campaigns and we did the Cheekman, obviously, because we were the kids and our one was a big success. And so we ran it for ages, like doing reports of the London music scene like once a month. Wow, so you like, I mean, talk about television, you were the prototype, you were the original. Well, no, this is much more professional than us. Actually, I did live, with the first show, I didn't know what live vision mixing is, you know, when you do the thing and they're mixing three cameras. And our vision mixer was Rod Rod Story, who's the most amazing vision mixer, and she taught me what, because I turned up and I didn't know what I was doing. She went, you have got no idea, have you? I went, no. And she said, you know, thank God you gave me that answer. And then she just ran me through it. So I was directing live within 10 minutes. you were minutes. learning as you were going. Well, it was easy. Just go, camera one, close up, blah, blah, blah. It's just brilliant. If you... Vision mixing is incredible. If the hands-on approach to the way... Well, it's... football. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Great example. Yeah, good yeah. concepts. And she was great. And then the other thing was we directed videos. We did one of status quo. And, uh, and I got told that I made them look... Um, too effeminate, so they never used a video. Which video was it? I don't remember. <laughs> I hate they, Too were, they weren't very nice people, to be honest. But we did loads of we did ha- we did Hazy Fantasy. Remember them? Yeah, of course. Uh, what was that tune? Uh, oh, hold on, Dan from the from Cuts. He was in one of the music videos. Yeah, was that the one you were talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that the video? Loads of people. I don't know yeah. if he was. I've known Dan since he was a kid. Yeah, good people. Big up Cuts. Yeah, big up Cuts. So listen, we're going to get in some. Listen, it's, we don't want it to all be. If you don't know, you don't know. We're going to get in some details. So if at any point we start going off on one of these tangents where people haven't got a clue what we're talking, about, we do have to kind of. Well, you've got to go and look up Cuts. You've got to look up yeah. James LeBon. Got All, day. Cuts. All day, James Bond. Um, and Mark LeBond as well. Mark LeBond, big up Mark LeBond, big up Crunch. Legendary photographer. And hey, Mark used to be my other. assistant. No way. Yeah, little and large. He was basically my assistant. When I had a photographic studio in Covent Garden, Mark was my assistant. I'm going to tell you something, actually, Cameron, because it's, it's come to my attention a bunch of times that when we talk about this level of street culture from back in the day to now and dealing with... The clientele such as Judy Blame, Mark LeBon, Buffalo Movement, all these things, uh, 80s Clubland, you know, Scarlet Cannon, these sorts of fashion Scarlet, icons. Scarlet, big up Scarlet. Big up Scarlet. You know, there's, there's a, lot of, um, a lot of street artists, graffiti writers, who grew up in that era. Yeah, Banksy. Yeah, exactly. It's that era of... Banksy's our friend. They love these, these episodes. Yeah, hold that, Goldie. Yeah. I met all that lot with Free Free. I mean, K1? I knew, yeah, oh, okay. that's that big up. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, 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 you know, they were all, they were all, in fact, Goldie turned up at my wedding with a huge tag canvas with Nenna in massive great big letters and right at the bottom, Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> you know, good work. Goldie. <laughs> Very good, Goldie. Up, Goldie. <laughs> Your legacy's crazy, man. Right, where did it begin? Because, because a lot of people out there, especially the younger audiences, you know, they're not as privileged as Mabel, where you're able to have a conversation. This and this is a rare opportunity for us to really get into. What, how do you get yourself into these positions, and what was the what was the beginning, man? Like, yeah, how did you begin? How did this all begin? Well, I think uh, like because I did quite a lot of. I suppose you call it mentoring, but basically, like I tell people now, it's like you you, you just got to say, okay, it can't be that difficult. And you just get yourself stuck in. I think the other thing is, is that well, I trained at a profession really, like I used to be an athlete when I was younger. And so I took that concentration and dedication through maybe the more difficult part of my adolescence. Mm. And then I think the first thing I did was uh, I got into photography. I, I got thrown out of college for dropping some acid and I got thrown out. <laughs> and so after three days, having been thrown out of school for burning down the the geography classroom so then I so then I um, ended up wanting a job and I thought where am I going to meet the most girls photography yeah, I went yeah. through the yellow pages found a guy he gave me a job and that's how it started and I think that that's kind of what people forget I think maybe the internet maybe scares people away from doing that because they feel now. like they're stalking mm. but you could in those days you used to, to ring people up and go look my name's Cameron do you mind if I come around see if I can blag you for a job and, and mm. like 20 people would go no but one person might and then you could go in there and I don't know I think that yeah, you just sort of found your way in. And then you got taught, back, back in those days, you got taught to do things properly. So in photography, you learnt all of the techniques. So I learnt to, I worked at the, the dark room that looked after the Condé Nast and Snowden and all those people. Mm-hmm. Learned how to light properly. And then I learned when I started making music that all of those things were applicable in music as well. All of those same, same theories. It's a recipe. It's a formation yeah, well, like, of things that happen. Yeah, the sort of the whole thing of the you know focus and speed and, and, and parallax theory and all those things that apply in photography, mm. they are actually the, the same with audio as well. That's so cool. Because I always think the analogy of cooking. 
recipes. But that visually, photography, same thing, isn't Nana, it? Nana, my missus, she does. She everything is via cooking. Hold tight, Nana. All hold day. big up, Nan. She, you know, she's literally the best cook in the world, and she, her whole theory about being a chill person and how she does all her therapy through cooking and that is just, and that's what mm. she's taught the kids, and that's what that's mm. the level in our life. It's like, and you know, all of those things are connected. Mm. She she did the cookery program as well, didn't she? She did a, a couple of bits with Andy. Yeah, I mean, I don't think Nana was really a huge fan of doing telly. I think she finds uh, telly a little bit shallow revs for her liking. No disrespect. Shallow. To Revs, I like that. That's but I think it, that uh, Nana goes a bit slower than telly can be. And the thing is, that I think a lot of the time of those shows, fundamentally, I did this earlier, it doesn't really work for Nana. Mm. This is something I met, you know what I mean, that whole thing. And Nana's whole thing, she goes in deep. So she's writing a book at the moment and the depth is... It's unbelievable. She's great for a podcast because literally, like you say, deep She's dive. She tangents is her thing. Huh? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, well, that's the whole great. thing. The book is about the <laughs> thing and then it's the thing with the add-ons and the add-ons are the thing, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. my life. Welcome to my life. That's yeah. like live with someone who doesn't finish a sentence or makes it into a book. It's like, <laughs> it's like. I'll whoa. read about it later. Just carry on. But she it. researches her songs really heavily. So when we go into a song, she's, she's in deep. Mm, so she she's making in. a documentary every tune. So it's great. That taught me my shit, you know. Yeah, um. But that's what kids need to know right now is that everybody needs to do their research. You've got the yeah. biggest library in the world available to you right now. It's not just for porn. It's yeah. there for other things yeah, too. Yeah. Porn's great, but... Yeah, 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 for real. No, no, for real is in like, it's... Well, not all porn's great. No, no, it's, some of it can be quite crap. Actually, you know, back to the point about... Back to the porn. You, of it, yeah, no, that's, the, that's the actress said to the bishop. Um, uh, Facebook was built on um, horny boys wanting to connect with girls i think it's ironic that now the internet has suddenly put a, a frown upon you know a, a, a mark on the idea of uh of that sort of behavior or something. well i like think that thing, cool. there's a whole thing going on at the moment it's currently credible for government officials to divert away from the shit they're getting up to by saying okay what's going on in schools is terrible they're not protecting girls and blah which is true which has always been true it's, always been it's not case. like girls Never. haven't always been sexually assaulted by every single boy in the school and talked about behind their backs yeah, that's it's just right. the level of exposure of it now is too much and the habitual scrolling thing mm. Not big up the man who invented scrolling, I've got to say, poor bloke. He's probably really guilty now, probably hung himself mm. one day or if he hasn't already because it's a terrible thing, isn't it? Because mm. this is... And so we got. Yeah, and I think that that's bad. But the whole thing of like people, even though it's available, right, and you can go and do the stuff that needs shaming, I think that it isn't necessarily something we have to gravitate to. What we mm. need to learn is that you need to not do it all the time you yeah. need to work out the time for it and the time not for it and that's what they don't teach you in school and that's what is bad i think i don't think that sex education in school is ever anything but embarrassing mm, yeah yeah exactly you can't it say the sense. word fuck at school you don't learn the word love at school yeah, when, no. how many times you learn the word how many, do you ever hear the word love at school ever, ever? never it's true it's come very first true. be the best yeah stand in line they don't teach you about money money they don't teach you about debt they don't teach you about credit cards they don't teach you about that shit they don't teach you about fuck shit. They don't teach you about like you know what your penis should look like. Mm. They don't teach you about what you should be you know how you should how you should rest, how to meditate, how to read a book properly, how yeah. to hug your friends, how to look after each other, mm. right? How to look yeah. after each other is a fundamental thing in life. You need to, yeah. you know, at but nursery yeah. school it's like. I remember being my first day at nursery thinking, wow, this is wrong, man. And I never settled at school after that, right, all the way through. Never such a waste. Wait, well, did it as as a as a young. As young Cameron was that young Cameron. As a young Cameron, as a as a early teens, like you would, like you mentioned, you burnt down the the, the, the burnt down the geography room. The geography yeah. room. So so is, was this like um, got nicked for it? Really? Mm. I punctured would... every single tire and every single teacher's when I left, and now I'm a famous old boy for that school. There's only two of us, <laughs> and which is ridiculous because I'm not famous. And the other one is the head of like worldwide head of well, the biggest music corporation in the world, and it's a despicable man. I won't say his name. And and uh, and uh, it's just like I, when they tried to do the publicise that, I went down and said I'd sue them if they associate you with that. Yeah, and I took all my medals out of the cupboard and all my cups that I won from when I was running, and I, I hated the place, and I nearly killed myself there. It was horrible. Horrible, was, yeah. Yeah, and I think that a lot of kids, more than 50% of kids through history in this country don't get educated properly. They don't, do they? No, man. One of my grand, one of my grandkids, he, like, he was having a hard time in Hackney. In the end, we had to put him through school and we had to, put, we had to shell out some grandparent money to look after him, and now he's cool. But looking at the, what they offered him in state school and so-called yuppie kind of, you know, I won't mm. say the word Steiner, but Steiner schools, pff, wrong the way he was treated. Yeah, 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 yeah. And kids, every kid in the world should be afforded the ability to... 
learn how to be a human. Yeah, it's yeah. a scary thing being alive, right? The other thing is, yeah. And the other thing as well is like you're, you, it's not you're steered away from being creative. You're steered away from having your own creative thoughts and challenging the status quo of what you're being taught. You're told to, you know, and you're told to creatively. get fit into the grinder, get down the plug hole. Yeah. Bottleneck, motherfucker, get there in. There are three things in life. This is one thing my mum taught me really early on because my mum was blind, right? So I grew up with a blind mother. So she always kind of had to, we had to deal with an alternative way of growing up. And right. my mum said, big fish, small pond, small fish, big pond, dig your own pond. And I was I was a pond digger. And like my whole family are pond diggers. And you, you just can't be, be a, you know, you don't want to be any of those. Because mm. if you're a big fish in a small pond, you're going to be a bully. Yeah. If you're a small fish in a big pond, you're going to get bullied. Yeah. And if you dig your own pond, you make your own rules. That's right. And you can be nice, right, if you're in your own pond. Yeah, absolutely. You dug your own pond. Pond. That's just everything that your mother said. Here's to her own ponds. Yeah, well, my mum had to dig her own pond because she, you know, would get thrown off the bus because they didn't want to take the guide dog. You know, in the pouring rain in the morning when she was going to work at the hospital where she worked, people would not let her on the bus because they didn't want to get the bus dirty with it. Or people were, you know, people were horrible to her. You see the the tr- real side to people sometimes, don't you? Don't you? But again, I don't think it's them. I just think it's people go a bit do lally because they haven't been hugged that morning or that mm. whole childhood or their whole life. And there should be a hugging lesson at school. <laughs> totally, totally. Um, with your skill sets, it sounds to me like you. And we're talking early now. So I'm trying to go through like I'm trying to create a timeline that, that kind of measure for measure uh, goes through your 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 career trajectory. And I'm I'm like thinking. Where did you get these? Abil- where did you get the ability to um, fill out a, um, a creative? Um, for instance, photography. That, especially when you deal with the processes of creating, that that's just not a normal. You've got to do the ten thousand hours and have a keen eye. You got to. Well, I suppose I got the keen eye because I was always describing stuff to my blind mother. Of course. Right, and so we're like. So that was, you know, you don't, you do tend to be, and that's also where I learned to tell stories and write lyrics because my mum would listen to audiobooks the whole time, and I would have to be describing stuff to her, and so that was that worked both of those things. I mean, that was un, that's an unfair advantage for any human. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you learn to be protective because you're, you know, you're with someone that you, you know, when I, if you walk along with me now along the street, I might go up down when we come to the curb. Still, all these years later, she's been dead for years, and I still do it by mistake sometimes because when we come to the curb, I don't want to see her fall down and. Oh, that is so sweet. But then I think I think that, that you, great. but your skill set comes about through necessity because my dad died when I was really young and I had to start fending for the family. So you you learn to come back, but you don't want to do. But I figured early on that you you want to be doing what you want to do. Mm. Probably only going to get a couple of years to run at it. So they go and do the things that you want to do. Learn really fast, but learn the process really fast. So get in, get involved, do the research, study it. Be Radar from MASH, you know, have the You thing. hearing this, people? Well, you know Radar from MASH is the man, right? Because he always had everything before he was asked for it. So, you know, be the best you can be, even if it's a menial task. If you're going to sweep up, have it done so no one's going to tell you to sweep and do it. So true. Because getting told is so belittling. So then get get done, 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 do, 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 research. Be there, ask for more, ask for more, ask for more. You're going to learn more and then that's how you do it. And then the energy of that is that you just, you know. And then also the other side of that, which I learned, maybe too late in life, is learn to turn off, learn to shut down, learn to meditate, learn to have a space of nothing because otherwise you're going to go pop. And I've, mm. I've gone pop a few times and I've seen people around me pop. I'm one of those kind of popping types. Well, we all pop. I think that's yeah, the creative. Yeah. Creative people pop. It's just for how long do you pop? Yeah. And what, can well, you yeah. get back from your pop? And how long's the recovery time of popping? Yeah, no, you're going to learn from that recovery. You're going to pop again, you know, and it's like, you know, because it's, it's inevitable, but you just have to learn those rules. And I think I, I wish I'd learned to meditate when I was a young un, mm. and I wish I'd learned to stretch when I was a young un. Stretching, man, no joke. Because I'm, yeah. I'm old now and I'm not it. very flexible and, you know, I have to, stretching really fucking hurts. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they tell us all the time in the gym, they tell us that every morning when you wake up there's something you should be doing it's all these um like you say it's the pop the pop analogy isn't it like you you can do as much as you can like you say you're you're very much the hands-on yeah let's do let's go let's go i'll do it before you've even asked something but also empower everyone around you as well so like the thing with me is is that you'll always be in a room where the people are really great and mm. try to just let them be really great so like i've been around to do loads of great things some really great records or whatever but i was around a really a lot of great people and there wasn't that much to do mm. Because if you're around really great people, you don't really even have to say anything. You're just there for each other. And if you know enough about the medium to know how great they are, then you afford them the ability to be themselves. And then if you have something to give, then less is more. And every now and again, when you contribute something, then it's 
So I like, you know, do, I've, I've worked on some really difficult sessions as well, but because the people were so good, the difficulty didn't matter and you, you just get swept away. You, um, as a producer, that's part of the... The part of the task isn't it? you've got to create enough um, energy for everybody in the room with the, the vision and explain and, ex and yeah and, and, and explanation that's explanation what is this and, project and there's about. a certain amount of discipline but like, that's just it's good parental discipline so you have to learn to give people enough rope to not hang themselves but but definitely do something that you didn't mm. expect so it's quite a thing I've enjoyed working with other producers and doing doubles, like, double ups and, and like, mutual admiration. Like Dave Allen that produced all the great Cure mm. records is someone I've worked with a lot. And we love being in the studio together cause, and we've done some wild music together. Bad but, man, bad yeah, man producer. Bad man, big up, big up Dave Allen. He's one of the greats. Actually, you know what? Uh, the, we had a couple of sessions, you and me, for my second album with Sweet Irie. Do you remember? Oh, sweetie, man. Big up, <laughs> big up Sweetie. Yeah. West London Massive. He's another un underestimated oh, producer, he's, he's man. A, and a great human. Yeah. Pebble dashed his room in, uh, in, uh, in the, what's that French seaside town in the north of France? I can't remember what it's called. Uh, Biarritz, the surfing <laughs> town. And we were there doing a gig with Nana and Sweetie and me went out in the bend when I woke up in the morning and he pebble dashed the whole room. He'd literally <laughs> We had to smuggle him out. <laughs> Love it. I can't imagine Sweetie being... Uh, well, imagine with, Sweetie drunk. Yeah, that must be the most fun rawr, drunk rawr, ever. Rawr, rawr. <laughs> sweetie, man. Rawr, come on, just pebble that's our room. <laughs> sweetie, Sweetie, you're going to have to come on and retaliate on this one. No, come no, on. he did. Do you know what? I, did a I posted a tune the other day, me singing, and Sweetie was all over it, man. He's gonna, apparently he's going to remix it, remould it, and come bring it back to me. He's proper, man. He is... So quick off the mark. Well, he did. He put the gorillas on the map. He'll do it. Yeah, it, without question. Literally, gorillas wouldn't have taken off. I mean, big up Damon, but but and and you know all middle the road crew yeah. and Jamie and all that crew. But mm. but um, but yeah, he he definitely put them on the map with that remix. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. they were struggling prior to that. Yeah, they really were. Hmm. No, I remember it so well. It was always on the radio. I'd be hmm. doing. I'd be in my art class. He's so commercial. He's like because you know what sweet his thing school. is. He thinks like a cartoonist. Yeah, he does, his whole thing it. is in. You can see inside his head. He's like a little cartoon weasel. And he's always thinking like, and he talks like it, and he's like, because he's all positive cartoons, you know. And... Without question, yeah, you're right. And even when he's in studio, his arms are flying. He's oh, he's, he's, he's just quick. He's super quick. He's like, he, I can I can picture it now. I've done so many sessions. You no, know, he's good, and he reminds me of because I used to work in Jamaica a lot. I used to work with a lot of Jamaicans back in the day. I used to work with a lot of Jamaican musicians to make pop records. They don't fuck about them guys. No, but they, you know what? That's good about them. They all like little cartoons and so little pop things. Like working with Flabber Holt from from Roots Radix. Best bass player in my opinion ever, and he, you could like they little cartoons and sweet. He's like that with his lyrics and his whole little voices <laughs> and his sounds and little breaths and everything. Mm. Everything's another little color and a little. Mm. It's like a cartoon with more going on. So every time you go back, you get a little bit. Because it's, it's yeah. like with beatbox, when you have a little bit of spittle, makes the rhythm and a little thing, and you don't realise it. The little click or something. Yeah, it's the clicks are the thing. The, but, or even if it's just the, 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 yeah, the, even just a. I love it. I love it when you can get a vo really great vocalist to get the snot dripping at the right time. It's like that's part of a great vocal for me. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. Thousand percent. Yeah. Right. So when a it comes snot to, dripper. Well, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. There needs to be like a a a, a, a sample pack for yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, about Splice, that. where you at? Um, yeah. Um, it's those little details, the, the attention to details, that makes a great producer, isn't it? Well, uh, oh, great. You come on. I mean, look, you know, the definition of a great producer for me is like a person who is adept at recognizing greatness and also is adept at being part of a team and is humble enough to recognize that that they know nothing and they're not really in control. And that's the art of great parenting. <laughs> you know, being a producer is like being a good parent. Basically, just my, my thing with parenting is I give up. Mm. What the fuck do I know? Don't do what I did and then you'll be all right. And it sort of works. And I think in the studio, if you walk in and just go, I don't fucking know. But when you're on it and you're producing a vocalist, you've got to know how to, to do what's necessary. So when you're working with singers, you've got to be able to be confident enough that if you go up and prod someone in the ad abdomen, you, you it's not... It's not offensive. It's it's an aid, and you're teaching people how to breathe and just how to relax and find themselves, because you've got to be able to put them in a place of confidence rather than just bursting their bubble. So, and that's the same again. Being a parent, you know, you've got to say no sometimes, but it's how you say no, isn't it? And why you say no, and when you say no, and in what voice you use to say no. And it doesn't no doesn't have to be the word no. Mm. You've got quite a bo bohemian um, life. I remember going round to your house 
many years ago and it was just so chaos is probably the most no not really i mean judy was kind of perched on the corner like oh, best big judy. up judy blame i miss judy oh. blames you know oh. right, i think uh, some, brett walker big up brett walker the yeah. photographer did the last picture of judy no and, way. and judy he's posted it online yesterday Amazing. and I, I just cried yeah because i was i was judy's primary palliative care nurse that's right you're death. looking after him the whole yeah me and the crew and, and big up dave baby as well who's also dave in baby. on set nana dave and baby Carly. and i camped in judy's house for a month after judy died just me and him yeah i, I lived i lived in it, the yeah. laundry cupboard and, and dave was downstairs on a couch and and we had basically we had a cowboy movie festival yeah, 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 for a month yeah. <laughs> big up dave baby. He's, dave baby oh man big up carly as well Big up carly Big up, yeah, but you know, they're fucking out. So many great people. But this is, the, this is the thing, and like a lot, I remember being around your place we got on a very few times, but very privileged times, because it was almost like, come on, come on, come all, be free. The calamity, the, like you say, the bohem, the, yeah, just, just organise chaos of it all of a sudden. Someone will run in and then they go and you're like, you don't even know if they live there or not. It's that <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> You know, well, now with you know, Keats was there as well. Keats, big up Keats. I saw her last night actually. Ah. You know, they're like, well, Keats was down with us in, in, and so was Judy in, in the back in the day when we moved to Allerin because we just needed to get out of London for a while. So we went to this roughneck Spanish town in the south of Spain. We all just moved down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story of how and why is nuts. But 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 Keats went to school down there. Andy Oliver, big up Andy, she was down there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tricky came and lived down there. Uh, Judy lived in an apartment in town in Allerin. This little Spanish random town had all of those same people lived in Allerin. Give and me the fucking tickets. <laughs> right, well, we're going back. Nana and I are going back there on Sunday, and we, we basically haven't lived there since we moved out in like I don't know ninety six. It's gonna be a or trip. Something. Well, we bought a house down there, so we're gonna go. We bought like an old little rundown Spanish little kind of shed, and we're gonna go and live back down there for a while just to see how, what, why, where, and when. Man. Nana's dad died in the same valley. So Nana's dad died in that valley. Mabel was born in there. She's Malagueña. Wow, wow. So Pablo Picasso, Juan Pablo Picasso was born in Malaga. He's Malagueño. He was Malagueño. There's a big magnetism of pull that's, you know, for every good reason is sending you that way. Have huh? you ever been there, Magla no, Malaga City? No. Malaga City is happening. It's probably the kind of funkiest place in Spain right really? now. Really? Yeah, it's, big, it's a big city and it's old and it's kind of a lot of gypsies, a lot of Africans. You know, the Moors and the... And the Andalou fought so much in those days when the when the Arab versus the Catholic thing was going on. That in the end, they just gave up. And there's a place called Cordoba, where in the middle of the mosque, this is a true story. It's still there. You can go there. In the middle of the mosque, there is a Catholic cathedral. In the middle of the mosque, no I swear, way. it's nuts. It's also the last place in the world where they have the British home stores, which is weird. In in uh, Cordoba, yeah. <laughs> but there's a there's in the middle. So you go in in the mosque and you see all of that tradition, and in the middle, suddenly you go in into Catholicism. Nah, that's they just, mad. They just went, yeah, fuck it, let's just yeah. give up. See, that's how groovy this place gets. See, that's mad. That's mad. and the the thing is from Alarim where where we are. The other great thing is you can see the Atlas Mountains across the water. Whoa. So on a clear day, you can see Atlas Beautiful. and you you, <gasps> you can see Africa basically. Home's always been important for you and, and, and creating, I've had a creative space, isn't it? Well, Nana's an African, so it's important for her to be able to see it because she comes from Sierra Leone. So. Yeah. And then uh, I yeah. spent a bit of time, I won't tell you doing what, but you can probably guess, down in Morocco back in the day when I was younger <laughs> and, uh, you know, doing little runs. So, mm. like, a, so um, yeah, I think home is important and we've always worked at home because we didn't have any money. And we had some managers that kind of, you know, what managers do back in the day. So we hadn't got any money to pay a manager. So we had to have the studio in the house. And so that's what the tradition we carried on. So every time in the old days, you used to get record advances back before dinosaurs existed. And when you got a record <laughs> advance, you bought a house and then you did the record in the house. And that way you built up your kind of house catalogue. Mm. That's when we became property tycoons. Yeah. Right. Pause there because I want to go back a little bit. OK, we'll get back to that bit in a second. Um I, I think for a, a lot of people, especially me right now, I, I'd like you to go back, if you can, back to a more new romantic era, a, a new a, a new two-tone era, an era where the 80s was kind of doing its thing, merging, and you were, you were on the cresp of all that activity, West End Soho, West End Lived London. Lived in Soho. Yeah, exactly. So there was all this interaction. You saw it from the... You were on the front line. So does that exist now, do you think? Do you think that, do you think that kids have got... I think that it's around now. I think that detail is around. But yes, I was around. Oh, I was, want you to explain it from a, from a... It was all based around clubs. So there was the Hot Sty, which was uh, Slits, uh, Float Up CP, and... and, uh, and, and uh, um, oh, God, what was known as? Rip, Rip and Panic. So all of that crew. So big up Sean Oliver, rest in peace. All that lot. Gareth Sager. 
all those crazy kids, you know, and, and Ari, big, big up Ari, bless her, miss her. So, like, all those people ran it and Rose, massive, you know, like Rose. So all those people ran a club and then and then Jamie and I did the, the – we had a club in where the WAG became the club. We had a little <sighs> one-nighter there. Then the WAG ran there. I lived around the corner from the WAG so I could walk there. So everything was based around – that area. Mm. And then Steve Dagger and uh, Graham Ball, who were the kind of managers around um, Spandau Ballet, they went to the London School of Economics. I think most people were art school or London School of Economics. Right. And then um, there was Chris Sullivan and Ollie that ran the WAG after me and Jamie kind of gave up on it. And then everything kind of centred around What did you it. give up on it? What, was that, what kind of policy was it? What music were you playing? What was the vibe? I mean, we just wanted to invite all our friends and have a laugh. And I think probably when we were there, it just was too much of a laugh. <laughs> we got booted out. Yeah. Whereas Chris and Ollie were a bit better at disguising it. What um, kind of music was it? What kind of... What kind of uh, well, we were into kind of like... Okay, so Jamie liked his kind of Manchester electronic factory kind of music. Yeah. And okay. I was just discovering... You know, I'd always been in... We, all of us were really into reggae music because of Ray Petra in Buffalo because he turned us all onto our reggae. We, you know, and we, we used to spend a lot... Like we used to try and go on holiday to Jamaica as much as possible. And so we used to play a lot of reggae music. We were, reggae was our thing. And we used to go to Weasel Shabin in uh, Acklam Road. Yeah. In fact, Nana and I used to be at Weasel Shabin most nights and we didn't even know each other and we never met each other once. Although wow. It took until we met at Heathrow Airport years later. But then, so that scene was really much Spandau Ballet. It was all these groups. And, and um, Chris Sullivan had his group called, uh, what were they called? I can't even remember what they were called. Then there was Toby and... Funk Apollo, and there was a few groups that were like trendy kids that had groups. Some of them hit, Jade was part of that scene. Mm. And some of them hit like her, and Spando hit, obviously, and some of them didn't. Mm. And um, I heard that Jade did pretty good, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's, I mean, you know, so that, so, it's yeah. Boy George and that lot, was that, was that? George was around, yeah, that was, yeah, and Tony was DJing at the WAG. Yeah. And uh, for, yeah, so fat Tony, big up Tony. What's the fashion? Because you, you look, you, you. Well, being the a Buffalo, everyone was different, but I mean, I, we we were Buffalo, so you know, my whole thing was was, was really rare. So at the time, we were wearing tracksuit bottoms, gold, um, medals from Elite, the Olympics, mm. Buffalo jackets, so the mm. MA one jacket mm. over the top of a t shirt. Everyone was kind of looking fairly like you had to go to the gym. Definitely, you weren't allowed to look mm. like a. You couldn't slack. Ex please explain that the, for for the people outside of uh, outside of the UK, especially, and for those that may not know from a. Fan Fashion point of view, how iconic this was. Explain the Buffalo movement. Explain the Buffalo scene. Well, okay, so Ray Petrie's kind of heritage was uh, he he was uh, uh, he basically started male fashion in the kind of macho sense. Bef prior to Ray, ma male fashion was a little just whack mm. and they were a little traditional and Ray just came from you know being gay and uh, you know really observant and really really he was just, he, he really. He basically was into really, really kind of hard and fit looking guys. So, for instance, Nick Kamen, who's the original, who just died actually. Um, mm. He was the, you know, he was one of the original models. His bar brother, Barry, big black jack from Paris, who was like really, who runs kind of all of the security now for all the French shows and everything, and runs a massive security company. Big, big, big. Black Jack and agree, he's amazing. All these kind of amazing looking guys, and they were just tough, stud, stud, yeah. but really fit. Obviously, male, male, mm. and they were a lot of them were were, were definitely not white, and uh, and, that, and they were suddenly being into a lot of magazines, and so uh, that had never happened before. I think it was quite racist and quite white. You never saw black models at all. No, 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 no. And then Naomi Campbell came through that scene. Yeah. So I've wow. just got an itchy nose. Hang on. Right. Got hay fever. Um and and so you can, know can you just put that in we'll get that as a sample pack ready to go yeah exactly <laughs> um you know so that and and then Ray's whole thing was you know he had a byline he had music and he was one of the first people to to die of AIDS so you know he he uh, he actually did the Paris fashion shows with copper so with the big purple cancerous blotches all no, over his body really? proud <gasps> front row wow and no and no, nobody even like he just it was per you know it was high fashion high fashion death wow that is. That is uh, life creating art. He was tough. I was with him when he got the diagnosis. It was just pretty out there. Wow. I mean, I speak to Scarlett Cannon about this. Um, that the eighties was also a, a, an era of such horrific atrocities with HIV and AIDS, with all these different uh, new illnesses that were coming into play. That would, you know, just the same as everything. I think sensationalism has always sold media, and and so it's easier to say something offensive 
and controversial if you want to sell copies. So, mm. you, know, you know, if it wasn't for controversy, then idiots like Laura Kunzenberg wouldn't exist. Mm. So it's like, you just, you know, anyway, Ray was kind of above all that. And he kind of, and a lot of current fashion, both male and female, is still based on his genius because mm. he was so simple. We, and the Face magazine was the, the sort of hub of that fashion. So we did the Felix Howard killer cover, which was the hat, Port Pie hat, Jamie Morgan photograph. Yeah, that was killer. cool, dude. Lizzie Tear in the in their Vietnam helmet with yeah. a cigar. Uh, you Before know, ID Lizzie. magazine and all this sort of well, stuff. Well, ID was it because Terry Jones that started ID was the art director at Vogue when I worked at Condé Nast. Barney Wong and Terry Terry Jones were the famous, and Grace Coddington was the editress. And and uh, and so he came from the Vogue Condé Nast tradition. And so ID had that class behind it mm. and that training yeah and then he went and did id with the kids Transferred, yeah. and it and that's why id was until it was bought i don't know you know it was i mean it's still great but it's not it, you know none of these things are great when they become franchised but they you, know, you, you just can't because the attention to details there not there but you know when nick logan had the face that ray and jamie were basically the major contributors from the point of view of fashion mm. ray was ostensibly the fashion editor of, of the face magazine wow and then, and then, and then it was just an era, a really concentrated era. So, so it, 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 and then the music at that time was heading towards being, you know, more melting pot. Mm. Hence the reggae music influence behind Culture Club, for instance. Hence the funk behind Spandau Ballet. Hence the reggae music and the ska music behind Madness. It was all just mm. a melting pot. So he was just observing and also contributing. So it's hard to say chicken and egg, really. They were all part of each other's thing. And then I came along because I had my observation training because of my working for Vogue and everything. So everything that came along, I could sniff it out like a bad fart. So mm. I was just chasing this and chasing that and then going, yeah, that's, you know. So, I mean, I literally ended up being Madness's road manager. <coughs> you know, so, and so, you know, did the picture by accident. Just because I was following them around the country, checking the music bonkers. out, just bonkers. Yeah, I was the I was the road manager on the two tone tour. And I might add as well, <coughs> if, if if you know of the tune "Buffalo Stars" by Nina Cherry, that's a lot later. It's a lot later, but I, but that's where it derived from. It was the <clears> it was it was more of a st a statement. It was it was a it, it was a way of life. Well, ba basically, Nana exercising. You know, Ray recognised that Nana was uh, was a powerful human and and had an amazing aura and an amazing look and he took a few of us to uh to to appear in a series of shows and fashion um exploitations in tokyo for a thing called men's biggie there's a guy called takio kakuchi who's quite a famous designer in those days from mm. japan okay. so we all went there and that's when nana's thing started to gel because that's when her her previous training as a human became suddenly interesting to the fashion uh, community and so that Buffalo stance then came out of the, the comment of Buffalo, and then we just we just used Nana to front it basically. Mm. Game in changer. In fact, Buffalo stance was actually a, 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 a B side to a boy band record that I did with Jamie for a laugh. We did we formed this boy band called Morgan McVeigh. We did this tune uh, that is so embarrassing, and um, and uh, it's called Looking Good Diving. If you want to well, laugh, we'll find it. We'll find go it. Go on the know. internet. Look for Looking Good Diving, Morgan mm. McVeigh. It's basically we were the forerunners to Bros. It was so embarrassing. But then we did. We needed a B side. <laughs> That's fantastic. No, I love it. We needed. Yeah. A, we made it at Stock Aitken Waterman Studio at, because um, I'd been working there, so I had the chance to make it there. And then, and that's where I kind of learned a lot of my chops in that world. And then wow. we needed to do a B side, so I just thought, well, let's put Nana on there. Come on, let's just. And so Nelly Hooper and me, Nelly Hooper produced the Soul to Big Soul. Big up, Nelly Hooper. Well, Nelly, you know, Nels kind of came up with the concept of. Only around the corner, innit? on Salisbury, that, that was where the old studio was. <clears throat> was that? Am I thinking right? Well, well, we did Buffalo. Well, the original of Buffalo Stance we did on. Uh, uh, we did now. Where did we cut the original? No, no, the original that we cut was just my, was just Nelly cutting up tape, and then we put Nana on a demo, and then Tim Simonon from Bond the Bass went in and reproduced it and made it into a single. That's why it sounds like a kind of a, a club. Mix. But it had club versus indie versus my kind of mm. reggae thing, and the lyrics were kind of me and Jamie doing our pop thing, and it was it just like funny. Well and then Nana, time, had, wasn't it? oh, Felt I mean, like it, it was just another one of those things where we dug our own pond. Yeah. It's just another pond dig. And then a lot of other things. And then also because we did it and then Nana got not tucked because Nana and I started seeing each other and then she got pregnant. And then we we had a record coming out and it went on fire and the record company needed an album. And we'd have to wait until after the baby. And Nana was like, what the fuck? Just, hmm. Why can't I go on top of the pop's pregnant? And then that became iconic. Yeah. 
And then, you know, we just sort of basically, we still didn't have any money. We had bailiffs coming around even after we had our first hit. Ray was dying of AIDS at that time. So we kind of had to, you know, Tyson was on the way. Wow. And, and Ray was dying. Then Judy came in to take over from Ray because Ray nominated Judy to take over. Strictly speaking, Buffalo should have carried on and Judy should have just taken over running it. But mm. you know how the people get and it just yeah. didn't work out. So And me not being one to stick around, I just sort of moved on to the next thing. But So then Judy became the our Ray. Mm-hmm. And then Buffalo Stunts came out and then we started doing, you know, then in between singles one and singles two, Nana had the baby and the baby from being in the belly was in the video. Cool. Exploiting our kids from an early age. Yeah. Hey, that's that's legacy right there. Well, they got paid by the way. And, yeah. and how many how many how many uh, kids can you say? Oh yeah, I was in my mum and dad's music video. Yeah, that's cold. <laughs> she was bigging us up from the stage last night, Tyson. It's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's thirty. She's thirty two now. That's mad. That makes you feel old. Yeah, all day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's not a day that goes by where I'm not starting to feel that way. <laughs> um, okay, so right, we're in the now we're in the, the production world. Okay, so we've. That the Nana Cherry. Well, you had to learn, you know, you do it yourself. Yeah, and that's just the, the principle of it. And that's something that I think, you, you know, I hope you guys are recognizing that if you're listening or watching, that you've most certainly, A, you've dug your own pond, but B, it's like you're reacting to mistakes and turning them into positives. You're making everything work. It's all about filing, I think, life, isn't it? So if you, if you keep a clean desktop, you've got to know where everything is. Because when you're going along, you hear this person do that and that person do that. And you've got to remember where it is. And at some point, you've got to assemble it. And if you can't find it, you can't assemble it. So literally, you have to remember where everything is. And so you have to have a good filing system, especially if you're as scatty as I am or trying to do as many things as I try and do, which is just stupid. So you just literally have to know everything where everything is. So when you're making an album, I suppose Royal Oak Sushi was the first album I ever made. And like the way that I did it was, and I used loads of people to help me, but I only never really went for any one thing. I just took the bits that I liked. And then this guy called Brian Chuck New, who was a great mix engineer, mm-hmm. really taught me a lot, who was working at Zomba Studios and where I mixed the whole album down. And we just have all these, in those days, you had tape machines and we had loads of 24 track tape machines, slaves they were called. So they were the extra bits. And then you were putting all the copying across from one tape to another and putting them down to a master tape. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so what Chuck, Brian Chuck New was really good at doing was syncing everything up so it sat properly. And then I would go, right, I want tra- that track there, I want the bass drum from there, I want the vocal off there, I want the st- string off that. And that's how we assembled everything. Whoa. And and so that's kind of, because I could remember how my mum had to remember in the kitchen because she couldn't see everything. So you'd knock stuff over in your blind, right? So you, she would just have to file it away to know when she's walking from the door to there, there might be a pot of water, the kettle, something hot is the flame on, blah, blah, blah. So that's what you're doing when you're making a record. And for the f- for t- photographic memory that you have, I guess it all... It well, all... that dwindles. And so as you get older, you just have to really make sure your systems are, 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 are fail yeah. safe, which they're not, as you know, because I didn't turn up yesterday, so... <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, what's, <laughs> ye- what's yesterday when this is probably like a couple of weeks old? I believe, but, um, uh, respect, integrity... Um, longevity, all these things, because I know you talk about having a good filing system, but when you're sitting in a mixing room in Zomba Records, what I'm musing, so please interject if you, you know, join in. I'm thinking if you're sitting there with Stockacre and Waterman, if you're sitting there in Zomba Street and the responsibility on you, right, there's not so much pressure on you, but it's that people around you clearly have they know your um, pedigree they know what you come up through they they expect something from you well yeah on the other hand like when you don't know anything your best option is to go like can you help me and then be good enough and respectful enough to listen and ask again if you don't understand or get on and prove that you do understand so you have to understand the basic concept of something everybody works at a different speed but really Mm -hmm. i've found over the years the better people you're working with the more honest you are with them, the more kind they are to be able to help you. I think really good people tend to get quite a lot of their skills and power from mentoring other people. I think a lot of what is good, you know, old people, who successful people can go two routes. They can either help other people or they can become egotistical. There's only two places you can go. And so you either sit back and rest on your laurels and go, look how many discs I've got, or you spend your time helping other people because then you learn from them. And most of the people I've been around that were teaching me were just able to help me. And then so I learned how to tune vocals at Stock Aiken when I got to work with really great groups and write songs and do stuff and assemble it really quickly mm-hmm. and got taught how to, you know, we were working on 10, 15, 20 songs a day there. We were mm-hmm. banging them out, banging them out. And I just thought, well, if I can do this on the left field, I've started a whole thing. And that's what we did. We just started banging it out. We banged out. We had, basically, my whole career has been Stock Aiken and Walkman for the mm-hmm. left, you know. 
Big up Pete Waterman. Big up, the, you know, the Matt and Mike. They're, they're, you know, they're... What's normal for the fly is chaos. No, what's normal for the spider is chaos for the fly. And the chaos doesn't really come into it, really, because chaos just feels like chaos if you don't know how to cope with, you know, finding your space within it. I was watching my daughter last night, and there's a thing for live musicians called in-ear, and basically you either get everything coming at you through a monitor to listen to what you're singing along to and your own voice, or you have these kind of magic headphones, and you can have you can design your own sound. But now getting used to using that... It's another thing. You know, yeah. It's like seeing everything in 3D for the first time. It suddenly becomes clear. But you know when you look at your first 3D picture, it doesn't quite work, and then suddenly you work out how to control your muscles in your eyes. Yeah, 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 so anyway, yeah. it takes about six weeks to learn how to do that. My daughters didn't arrive until 1 p.m. yesterday. She did the gig last night at 8 p.m. It took her one song to nail it. I, t I was like... Damn. And she turned around. I saw her go half after the first time. I saw her turn her head and smile, and it was ah, oh, there you go. And I was just, I started crying. Yeah. And well, I, because she sonically had it correct in her she head, just she worked just worked the it. equation out. She just calmly yeah. went, okay, that's not right. But I know this there somewhere. And she could see her just turning her head and turning her head, and then she went, and I saw her smile, and then she just because she could. That's see the it. coldest. She, that it was a parent. so cold. And I was like. <laughs> And I, I just yelled out. She smiled. Dad! <laughs> you must have been gassed. I would have been oh, so She proud. was gassed that I recognised her. It was good. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Uh, I used to I used to take one ear out because I just couldn't feel the energy. Of the, it's you, a mad one, though. You, you can get... Um, you can work it out so that the energy is pumped back in. Yeah. There's two ways. Michael Stike from REM taught me that you can drill a hole, but there's another way. He, they, tell you, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of REM. Yeah, band. of course. Yeah. Very great singer. Michael Stike, great songwriter. I was driving along with him in a car once and he wanted to play me something from the tape and my car wouldn't play it, so he just turned around and sang it to me. I just turned around and went, you witch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's that guy. <laughs> anyway, he taught, he taught us how to drill holes in his, um, in his thing. But I've, I've and learned... And that works? Does it work? Yeah, you and, the yeah but it's not as good. If you seal it and you go with it and you learn it and you're working with good people, then... Uh, you're and, good forever. And yeah, we've got one magic guy that deals with all that stuff called John Tonk. So oh, I nicked off Tricky years and years ago. And he's big up John Tonks. He's mm. the magic guy behind all of the stuff we do live. And he's he taught us how to just have patience, have make time, do the work. And he got Tyson through two just two. They just did two days rehearsal. He didn't panic. He said, "No, keep with the ears. It's going to be fine. They'll arrive. The post office will make it work. If no, we'll give you headphones. That's fine." And she just did it. And they and it's quite scary because they put the stuff in and it seals. And it suddenly goes, "Can't it?" Gone. And you suddenly everything's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's so frightening, and then it's just you, and you sound so loud and out of tune. Yeah, and exposed, yeah, yeah, she's like yeah, standing yeah. there, start bollock naked on stage, and she just did it. Bless her. That's so sick. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned Tricky a couple of times. So let's get Trickstar. Into, let's get into the Massive Attack era when you were on in Kensal Green, and you again going back to that cottage industry, doing everything from home, the studios. That tell me about that story because Nana mentioned it on the last podcast we did with her you can go they live with us yeah that's it they, we you, made blue lines in the house yeah, we, that, in the, the poo room album. yeah we called it the poo room because it stank because there was three guys living in it right so explain the situation so so the, the room itself explain that the, the well we bought things. we managed to buy with nana's first publishing advance back in the day we managed to scrape together the deposit to buy a, a, our first house it's when we sort of because we were living in a pretty horrendous flat in Cromwell road or somewhere and it was we had some scary neighbor who'd taken too many drugs and was really frightening to be around and we didn't really like leaving the kids there and so we bought this house and um and of course we couldn't afford to work anywhere because we'd spent all our money so uh we started working there and, and nana started being successful and then mushroom from massive attack was coming up to mind the dex 3d was helping us write raps we were just meeting people through nelly basically because we had we were connected to bristol mm -hmm. nelly was just introducing us because he's part of our little crew and mm -hmm. well our little no not crew he's in fact nelly's not part of our crew he's just a, an old friend and and um and so they 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 were headed towards making a record and they were going to go to the same management that we'd just fallen out with and we were like oh, that's not going to work and we needed to be able to pay our ellie our pa because you know because we had the office in the house the studio in the house kids on the way mm -hmm. already existing kids from our previous marriages blah 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 so i said to them like, come and chill out and chill up here come and start making some music i'll show you how to make songs from these little gro grooves you've got and we started working me and johnny dollar god rest his soul we just started you know i bought this engineer in who i've been working with he was from the kind of talk talk radio head type stuff and i thought nice. that would work well with the yeah. dj thing so he came in and started and then i worked with will malone on strings and stuff and we got all these people in that would make it unexpected they started living in the house and making the record on two eight track and stuff and then um and then basically we did what we thought were going to be demos they thought were going to be demos and then they wanted jazzy and nelly to visit because they'd had their first hit then so they wanted jazzy and nelly to 
to um, produce the record. So we went to uh, Brit Rose Studios in, in Hislington where Jazzy and Nelly had set up camp mm -hmm. to meet them one evening. And we got there and as we arrived, Jazzy said, I'll be back in a minute. And he met, went out on a date for dinner and we were all sat there for like two and a half hours. And in the end, they just turned around and went, Jack, don't you make records? Fuck this guy, let's fucking leave. Really? And we went off and that's how I ended up producing the record. I'd been wanting to, but I didn't like yeah. to, because I'd been helping them with their business. I you didn't want like to suggest got it. it along and not yeah. be too in and the And then Dollar like, was yeah. in there. And then we kind of did it. And then we did another whole load of stuff down in Bristol. So I moved kind of within 20 minutes drive of where they were. I didn't want too close. But, so See I what happened, Jazzy? You missed your opportunity for, for girls, you know? Yeah, it was a bit funny because, I mean, I don't know why. Maybe Jazzy didn't want to do it. Yeah, maybe it's just one no, of them, isn't it? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Because Nelly made the second one on his own. He didn't do it with Jazzy. And I think, Jazzy, you know, because Nelly, because I think Blue Lines wouldn't have been Blue Lines if they'd done it. And then I think that the second record was great. And I think the two worked really well together. So we kind of complimented each you other. You kind of helped, I mean, fair, fair bit, Massive Attack, come on. But for you to bring in, have the idea of bringing in strings and more kind of, like you say, Radiohead-esque influences, that essentially well, formed an, an, a, a genre, dude. You've got, to, you've got to be able to not be, like, I like R&B. I love rap. I love reggae music. I love punk. I love jazz. I love, and I love orchestral music. I love rock. Mm. I love acapella music, mm. love beatbox, and yeah, it. But it's like, for me, like it's the more shit you can get into the cooking and get away with it, the more interesting the meal, right? Yeah. So you know, obviously, without, you don't want to crowd the room with every track, but you definitely want to have a little flavor. So, do you ever think a lot about frequencies and and yeah, and, and you know the space in a in a, yeah. in a tune? And it's and that annoys a lot of the people I work with because they think, well, what do you know? But like, I I kind of. Yeah, I do. And I kind of think Nelly, again, he's come up, <laughs> Nelly, you've come up a lot in this. Huh? Mm -hmm. Nels um, taught me once, he said to me one day, you know what, it's fucking weird, isn't it? He said, when we're going to make a record, every time you just basically, it's like you've never done it before. And I just went, you just nailed it. That's the thing. It's, if, it's like whenever I go in a room, it's like, I, I, well, why are we here? What are we doing? What do mm -hmm. I do? Mm -hmm. And that is what makes it playful. Yeah, it makes it work, you know, and it, it, it's just like because everything is different. I mean, yeah, there are things that are the same. The desk is the same and blah, blah, blah. But fundamentally, every single thing you do is different, right? It's part of the energy that makes the record what it is compared yeah. to. Do, do you think that because obviously Massive Attack, you had the home studio where I guess you were able to create and perfect certain things and repeat them until they worked and, and more time to do stuff. But like you say, when you've got the biggest studios, it's like you go into the unknown and it's like... That... Maybe, maybe this is a bit dangerous territory, right? But I mean, like, for me, dictaphones are really important because you want to capture that first moment and you never... I remember the first time I heard One Love, which is one of the tunes on Blue Lines, and Torres Andy singing it, and he basically had set up the backing track that Mush had made. And he... And he uh, He'd recorded that on a Gato Blast in his room with his then girlfriend um, playing along on a keyboard roughly. And he sang and recorded the sound of that into another Gato Blaster in the room. And it goes, one love, it's you I love, and not mm. another. And he's got that mad Horace Andy in old school. Bad and, man. Oof, big up, sleepy mm. man. Anyway, he... he um, and it was me that put him in there because Dick Jewell, big up Dick Jewell, great artist from back in the day. Dick Jewell used to run the label that brought in Dennis Brown and Gregory Isaacs and all those kids in back in the day when he was still at Royal College of Art. And he introduced me to Horace. So it was, that's how we put Horace into Massive Attack because they wanted a classic old reggae. Saying, I don't know Horace. Yes. I knew Jackie Mitto. I knew all those guys. And so then he was singing that. And I remember I was driving across from Chippenham where we were sitting on a little farmhouse we'd rented. I was driving over on the old bath on the, a, on the A4 and there were balloons coming up because there's a lot of ballooning down that way. And it was sunset because i would work at night a lot of the time okay and um and i remember hearing it on my car stereo i just bought myself my first brand new car and it was a volvo estates you know family business and and i remember driving with that in the car stereo hearing horace's voice thinking how the fuck am i gonna make it sound as good as this ever and that is breckel production because yeah. then i had to spend ages in a real recording studio making it sound as fucked as that thing and in the end i ended up you know, like, I think I failed because it never sounded as good as the demo. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that, like, that's a lot of the thing that you do. It's just like that original first moment when people shave things off. And when we did Blue Lines, we did most of the record up in, in the Pooh Room up in London. And we'd go down and we'd work for ages trying to recreate tracks to make it sound more technically adept. I'd wait for them to go home and I'd take the demo and don't tell anyone and, <laughs> and put it onto the two-inch. So quite a lot of people set up their studio with um, saying, oh, it's an amazing technical album, you know, we set up a studio. I was copying half-inch and quarter-inch, eight-track 
Fostex onto two inch with the compression going. And people think that that's technically like really, but I'm like, yeah, you know, it's a secret. I can't really let on. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, you're not supposed to do that for you readers at home. And, yeah, and yeah. that's what made that record sound so fucking crusty was the fact I was just copying chunks of it off the demo. Mm, I've, said, I've said this a bunch of times on the podcast, and I think you're a great person to throw this at. Um, producers tend to be, I mean, apart from like this, like they love to somewhat almost treat their, their experiences in the studio like they're inventing the wheel. Ah, oh, fuck that. But they also, they also are on the plus of some of the most prompt, uh, timekeeping human beings that, you know, kind of put us artists in line. Be on time. I was a day late, babe. What are you talking about? <laughs> apart from, apart from the podcast is different. <laughs> <laughs> I don't wear a watch, man. Do we you do... think so? Do you think, do you think that's the case that, they, that without the producer, the, the writers would run riot, wouldn't they? I think, it, well, the thing is now, because the producers, every, everyone's a producer, aren't they? So it's mm. different. Yeah. yeah, back in the day, we were supposed to be like schoolmasters, but I wasn't part of that brigade because I didn't come through that route. So, like, I don't care. I mean, you we, seemed a lot more casual than Nana the reminded average. me last night about the sound of us lot in the studio in the middle of the night, me and Dave Allen running amok in the studio while she was trying to sleep, having our second baby, you know what I mean, with Mabel. And, uh, <laughs> You know, it's chaos. I mean, the chaos, the parties, the the fun, the good times, the sad times, they're all part of the equation, you know, and that's what makes stuff so real. And demos make great records. Mm. And anyone who tells you different is talking shit. Because when you first do something, that's why I've got this rule, right? I don't let people leave the studio telling me they're going to do the second verse tomorrow. Mm, no, you do the verse yeah. now, babe, because we're going to forget why we were here and it won't mm. be like it's about the same thing. Oh, no, it's fine. I'm running out of time. I've got a note. No, I'm sorry, but you're not leaving. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get it done because you won't match it. No, man. When we did Unfinished Sympathy, I wouldn't let anyone leave the room for a piss, even. That's a big, that's an important fun. And we had, we were short of a single. Ashley Newton said, you need a single. The guy, the A&R man from Circa. And I was like, okay. We went into the little room next to the, it was the rehearsal room next to the coach house studios. And I said, we're going to make a tune. They started the thing. I wouldn't let anyone, no one was allowed to leave the room. People were desperate. They got done. And that's why you have to do it. Because I just thought this is going to go off. It's not going to work. People are going to be... And then people were just like, take the chorus. I remember Freedy because I wrote this naff chorus. And he was like, that's bollocks. I don't take it out. And he, went, and he took it out because he was desperate for a piss. You know what I mean? So he took it out. And he was like, my chorus was so shit. <laughs> and then it's just got the sample. And it's brilliant, right? Yeah, yeah. 3D, big up 3D. Hey, that, was, that was Dell's man sitting there going, your chorus is bollocks. I'm like, what do you mean? Wow. He was, he was angry because he needed a Jimmy Riddle. And he was right. That's hilarious. So I finished sympathy. My core, I wish I could remember my course. It was so terrible. I finished sympathy was the way it was because Treedy was desperate for, for, for a gym. Yeah, he wanted a Waz man. He would literally, that was literally. And when we were doing that record, at that part of the record, he tried every single room in the studio for his vocals and he ended up doing all vocals in the Kazi because that's where he felt at home. Yeah, that's what Nana said, that this was the thing. They, they, they would go into they the would toilet. Always, yeah, when we had the, well, we had the fair light in the toilet upstairs in, in, in our house in, in Mortimer Road. Road. Yeah. So you had to piss. Across, so the fair light had yellow right across the top of the brain of the fair light. No. And we did vocals in there. No, we did the vocals in, in, the, in this house outside where Nana was feeding Tyson on the land in there because that was the best place where Dollar felt, thought that. There's, a, there's actually a tape of Dollar, because Dollar got attacked by one of the singers because he was a boxer and he didn't like being pushed around. So there's me separating them, trying to stop Della from getting killed. And then there's another one subsequent to that where Nana was doing a track that we were working on and, and I tried to prod her in the abdomen and she'd not let long, long given birth. And you can hear her hitting me with the mic stand. Dollar kept a dat of me being the tech, you fucking rah rah, dish the binga. And I got beat the fuck. I had bruises for weeks. She picked up a fucking white thing and slashed me. I fell down the stairs. Dollar recorded it. I could hear him chuckling while I was getting blows. Again, sample packs will be available soon. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Dude. So that's my production You do skills. know that people listening to this, right, you know, the, 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 these in accounts of what went down, which... So seismic. You know, I didn't get credited as producer on Blue Lines. Why is that? Because, um, because, because they said it's it's kind of because I was managing at the time, which was a nightmare. But like, it, you know, like I and I was just I didn't care. So I got I, I said, well, okay, you didn't call me the executive producer because that means nothing. And so Dollar got the only production credit, and you know, bless him, I don't care because he he was the sort of person that needed the work, and I didn't. An executive producer means nobody, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the twat, it something. Whatever. Well, my managers get that, don't they? They get those kind of credits. Sometimes, yeah, but it, it's, it, and I was fine with it. And so these days, I still, you know, I mean, obviously, I did the production, but it was like uh, it, it just doesn't matter. 
The worst thing about being credited for something is someone's going to ask you to recreate the thing you got credited for. True. And who, want the, who wants to do what you've already I bet. done? You know yeah. what I mean? I want to do something out of nowhere. And then you've got to live off your rep, which means you're going to get people treating you in a way which is... So, like, right now I'm just some old weird guy that comes in the studio. No one knows. The kids don't know who the fuck I am, and that's great. And I'm some weird guy, and I say, why is he there? You know, and eventually maybe something happens, and they go, oh, that was amazing. Mm. And you go, well, okay. See you later. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> My time here's done. <laughs> um, Mabel, do you go into the studio in those situations where she's creating an album? No. She's pretty sort of, she's pretty on, out there on her own now. I mean, she's she came through some pretty strict um training in stockholm when she was going to school she went to so when we were okay when so what was that 2004 we moved out of london so she was young and she'd just seen me what i just done back to back sugar babes and and all saints mm. first albums so it was the first time i was in pop mode but i was in pop mode because my kids were the right age so when mabel was kind of into pop that's when I did Babes. So I used to take her to the studio. She was really young, but she would just go, I like that one, I like that one. And then when I when Tyson was the same age, she, she was kind of helping me with All Saints. And then uh, we moved to Sweden because Tyson wasn't getting on for school. So we moved to Sweden and then they all learned to speak Swedish because they didn't speak Swedish in the house, even though it's Nana's first language, but she never taught them Swedish. And then they went to school in Sweden and then Mabel ended up at a school that was based around music. So did Tyson actually as well. And then they both kind of got their chops there. And then when it came down to time to get ready, we moved back. Tyson moved back first to go to uni. Mabel moved back with her mum about a year after I moved back. I went back to set up and then they, she came back. And then she started saying, I want to make fucking... Well, first before that, Oscar Scheller, big up Oscar. Oscar. He, Oscar. He, um, he came, flew over and worked with Mabel just to get her started. And then she came to London and she did a bit of work. And then she just got really like, I need to do this. And we found, I can't remember who it was, but we found something on SoundCloud that we both liked. And I noticed that the manager was listed. So I rang up the manager and, and blackmailed him into taking a meeting. And I said, you'll never have to see me again if you take her on. And they just loved her and they took her on, gave yeah. her her first couple of chances in the studio. And then she kind of did it on her own after that. And then she met Rada, her current manager, via uh, Grace Lajoa, big up Grace, big mm. up Rada, and and um, congrats on the new baby Grace, and and uh, they um, they started doing their own thing, and I've not really, I'm only really there to fire people, really. Mm. That's my job. Right. Okay. So this junction, you wouldn't want, want to sing in the studio with your dad, guy. No, you know? no. But but you know, with the plus, she's running today. You don't tell Mabel nothing. Yeah, she's on it. She's on her grind. She can she? punch too. You don't want to get in the way of her punch. Yeah, fine, um, but. Same with Tyson. Tyson, I can't really, you know, I mean, I mean, poor old Tyson, she's been on the road with mum and dad. I mean, how degrading is that? But I mean, maybe a bit better with mum than with mum and dad. But she sang, I mean, Nana did backing vocals and Tyson and me did lead vocals. I mean, poor chick. Um, there's there's got to be a side to Cameron that, you know, get her on the books and I won't call you again. Kind of, those kind of conversations... I, well, no, no, I mean, worst, you're my mate, but I would also... No, the worst also, thing is if, if the threat of me yeah, is that's enough what I'm to thinking. get anything for anyone. So, what, like, so if you where don't does that come fucking from? do it, Cameron. Where does that come that. from? Where does that come from? I suppose I come from quite, a, you know, my family. But there's a part of my family that are from Bethnal Green and we know what that is. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I suppose, um, you know, just I'm just so belligerent and horrible and, and emphatic that you just don't want me in a conversation because I just won't shut up. <laughs> God, I love it. I'm so glad you're on my side, baby. <laughs> I'm so glad. Well, you see me go off. I <laughs> yeah. mean, it's like, you know. And, you know, when and it works. It's effective. Yeah. You know, it's like. And plus the business is so full of people who know nothing and, and get involved and stop people being creative yeah. and try and tell you it's quick. Because the whole thing about the record business, the corporate side of it, is they want everything to be like the thing before that was successful. Yeah. When they when when history dictates that, the thing that's unique is the thing that's going to sell the most and last the longest. So why they get there from there is beyond my comprehension. Mm. And in fact, we just went into this thing with this manager guy who I was told was going to really help Nana with the kind of where we were trying to get to, and I didn't really want to run the business. And and he just came every single thing he came with was a derivative thing of something I'd already seen, and it was just like, what? Shut up! The mm. whole thing about Nana is she's unique. Just let her just. And that's so one bit swan, man. He got the fuck fired, really. Quickly. Did he? Yeah. He got the fuck fired. Get the fuck out of I'm here. I'm good at firing people. I can make people feel wanted after they've been fired. I mean, mm. Firing people is really difficult because you're breaking their heart. Yeah. But if you fuck up, you've got to be fired. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've heard these. Th there's a theory to this. It's like hiring people is easy. F firing people, you've got to know. When you go into things with someone, you've got to make them understand that there is a potential it might not work out. 
at its core, that's because you have and that, to. That, that's that's the extra extra edge that allows them to be on their. I'm just bringing ones. in this kid now who's related to me from Copenhagen, who's going to go and work with my goddaughter, who's really talented, mm. and I'm you know she's worried that the responsibility, obviously, the first thing she's going to think is, well, what if it doesn't work out? So I've got to tell him coming in, this probably won't work out, dude. But, mm. so, and I'm going to tell you, fuck off. So. Mm. You got on, you do you got do that a lot? Do you give people the forewarning? Yeah, definitely. Because that gives people the edge, You've the A to. game, doesn't it? They've got to. There's no, there's no point because you, because shock is, you know, there's nothing worse than post traumatic stress. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like if you don't warn people that, and it's not to keep people on their toes. It's just that you have to, you have to have a, you know, there has to be clarity. And there's so much, especially now, I'm seeing people dying or you know, because we were yeah. at that age, you know, when people are dropping, and you're seeing all of the history that everyone tells you was the reason that they're pissed off, and mm. you did this, and blah blah blah. And it's like, really, cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. If really, if that's really where your head's at, I mean, I'm, I feel bad that you even can be asked to think of that because mm. when it was over, it was over, yeah. and it was great, and everything we did was great, and you remember that. One, I don't agree that it happened, but I ain't even going to go there. The point is, mm. I'm not even going to follow your Instagram anymore, bitch, because fucking, what's the point? Because mm. you're just being negative, man. So do you think that's, yeah. That, why, why put that kind of pressure on you as well? What's that? Where's that People just from? do it to themselves because they're kind of, people get, people think that, you know, look, you, you look, creativity, if you, no, a conduit is like a drain pipe, right? Something through, a vessel through which water passes is mm -hmm. a conduit. Anything through, so a drain pipe's a, conduit so if you think about creativity coming from the gutter it's the water and it's got to flow to the recipient which is the drain at the bottom mm -hmm. people who constrict the flow of the water through the conduit through the drain pipe are basically taking it or trying to take ownership of the creativity mm. we don't own anything these are just ideas that come into our head but they existed everywhere they're not ours i mean i didn't mm. make blue it's not mine mm. i didn't make the noise that came out my mouth that came from the miracle of life mm. if you start saying oh it's mine that's why i never keep my discs and all that shit because mm. it's like that's looking back you know you just want you know yeah i was okay i remember doing that about nana's writing a book and i really have trouble remembering anything and in fact like <laughs> it's not ours to own right yeah, and yeah, i think yeah, the yeah. people that think that it's theirs and are jealous because they think you've they've you've stolen their limelight and blah 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 really obviously okay but you know where that is i think because you're a team leader you're a team you're you're a motivator and a, and there has to be someone there and they, that for some, that reason, some, there has to be in, someone in to take some the slack. things. I am, yeah, but I mean, it's like in. I come up with like in. Okay, here's an example. Lockdown starts. I'd been on holiday, came back, and suddenly we needed to come together as a family. We decided as a group that we weren't going to go to the family stronghold, which is in Skåne, which is in a region of the south of Sweden, which is where I, when where Nana's mother built the the place for people to go at the end of the world but we couldn't get there and it felt a bit like, okay, this is too much of a throb. And it was hard to get the kids, even though they're adults now, to all believe it was going to go like it was mm, going to go. Mm. So then we had to take our little ex-council house in, 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 you know, in underneath Trellick and make that into, into a place where everyone was going to come back and be as a group. Now, mm. so obviously Mabel was kicking off, Tyson was kicking off, Nana was kicking off in their careers. So it's, a, you know, there's a kitchen, there's a studio in what was the garage, there's a First floor, which is a lounge, and there's a bedroom where Panda, Nana's sister, and works with, who works with Mabel, she sleeps. Mm -hmm. And there's two bedrooms at the top. So Tyson and, well, in fact, Mabel was being mobile between the two sisters, the auntie and the sister. And mm -hmm. Tyson was at the top. Nana and I are in the bedroom. Mabel's got TikTok going off like, so we had to have the living room as a full time TikTok studio. Tyson and Mabel between them were running the studio. So they were literally just that. I couldn't get in there. Wow. And I'm thinking, okay, so I'm not working in the kitchen because Nana's running her business from there. So fundamentally, I've got a, my meditation chair in the corner of my bedroom and we're going to probably be locked down for a year. And I just went, well, okay, what can happen? And so then you just go, okay, well, I can do this on the internet. I can grab that. I can do this. And then I've got my music going. I've got a little table and starting. And you get this thing going on and you just start bringing it in. Now, I brought it in to help a load of people who were around me and to help myself from going nuts, mm. right? And then now there's then they started to look towards me as being the team leader, and I'm like, whoa, this isn't that now. We're the co-op. We're the co-op now. Mm. No, you guys have got to take some responsibility now. First lockdown true, ended. True, true, yeah, yeah. But yeah, first yeah. time, first lockdown ended. And we're ready to ship, and we're going to ship to the said house. But Nana and I now decide to go away and leave the kids in London because they know how to do lockdown. Now we, they decide still not to come. We're going to go. So we bought a dodgy car, drove this left-hand drive car to Sweden, all in one hit, and basically set up shop there for like six, seven, eight, nine months, whatever. 
and then kind of did the same thing again, running the same thing, you know, running a few projects, making some music, blah, blah, blah. Now I'm, now I'm back now. Where are we now? It's what, June, blah, 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 11, 10, 9, 10. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah right, yeah, yeah. so we're back for this time and everyone's still looking to me about why, you know, stuff. And I'm going, whoa, 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 your thing's happening. You're doing this, but now you have to run this and you and you need to go and do this and blah, blah, and stop treating me. Like, mm. I'm not a fucking piece of elastic you've all got to step up now and do that and they're starting to realize oh shit yeah you're right you know mm. because that's you can't be leaning on everything yeah. all the time you've got to be and you've got to teach people to i think the most important thing that a person can do a mentor a producer an elder is teach people how to stand alone mm. a parent yeah. letting go of your kittens letting go of your puppies is difficult but you know what dogs do they start fucking attacking them to get them the fuck out of the nest come the time mm. You see the mum, she turns on the kids. It's like they will literally go down, buy a fish, get a fish from the, the dock and bring it back to their puppy. And then six weeks later, it will kill the puppy if the puppy doesn't get them fucking do it themselves. And, you know, and that's... Well, uh, yeah, well, that's it. Tough love. Well, I think that's the nature. But humans are not like that. You know, me and Nana are going away, like, tomorrow. And we're like, well, maybe, you should, maybe you should put it off for a week. And it's like, I'm, I'm worse than her. Mm, what, you, you, you would rather just hold <laughs> I just don't want to be you. Yeah. <laughs> um, you guys, man, I... I inspires a shower you guys and always have done ever since I've met you the bohemian the way that you guys come on we're in your artistry. amazing inspiring studio and it's, look at what you totally, do totally totally but this all of this the majority of this is loosely based on the um the grid system that I adopted through meeting the characters like yourself and you just you feel things out Dave Baby's a great example as well who just embodies his art he does his thing and there's no one else like him no one will ever be no, like no no he's literally He's literally the best at what he does that's ever been. Yeah. There hasn't been, literally, I mean, in history, there's never been an artist as pure yeah. and unassuming. Yeah. He made me a, a, a wooden, well, he, made, he didn't make it for me, but he made a wooden, uh, it was, Judy hung it on a piece of cord and it was a piece of wood. Yeah. And it was a looked like a flower, but actually it was a clitoris and a <laughs> vagina. But Standard. you didn't, do you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said to him one day, "Why do you only ever make dicks and pussies?" You know, and he went, "Well, you know, it's wood, isn't it, Cam?" He said, "Either you know, it's either a pole or a hole." I mean. <laughs> And you think about it, you're, well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. Go and that's how genius Day Baby is. It's true. It's true. And these are the it's you guys have created hole. the DNA of like of what I feel like real artistry is about. And you live it, you breathe it, you you um, pass on information. You 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 know, like like you say, the conduits that the don't let don't, don't get in the way. But don't you find that being able to just be there with each other is part of, of, of would, I mean without that doesn't it mean that we just stop to function I would be a complete blubber on your own isn't it yeah that well, would even, suck. I mean I can spend time on my own but it's yeah, like yeah. if I didn't have all of you lot and if I didn't have connections with you all and if I didn't have this wonderful view now as an old an older person because I'm kind of you know I nearly get my old I, in fact, I get bus pass now and and you know like I see you lot doing what you all do, and I'm so proud that I've watched you all grow up. You know what I'm saying? And, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. you really make me proud. I was just watching Thank your, you. your interviewing skills just then thinking, oh, he's keeping me on track. Mm -hmm. Go. Super pro. Super pro. Yeah, no, but it takes time, doesn't it? And uh, time is one thing that we do have. It's the biggest currency we have as artists. Or, yeah, it is, even although life is short. Yeah, no, that's right. I, I've, you know, there's enough people in West London Cemetery that shouldn't be there, right? Yeah, for sure. Fucking hate that place, and it's like I was look. I was working in the studio, a really great studio that overlooks the back end of it. It's actually on Scrubs Lane. It's one of the warehouses in Scrubs Lane. So when you go out to the back balcony for a zubby, mm -hmm. and you're looking out over where Sean's buried, and you know Sean Oliver, and loads yeah. of people, and you look at it, and just it puts you in your place, man. When you're making a Freddie Mercury's around there as well, isn't he? Yeah, man. yeah. So many famous people in that cemetery. Madness, isn't it? No, not madness though. No, not madness. Um, they just legendary out a film, right? I know that's right. Madness, right? And again, there, there's also documentation that suggests that they were some of the most earliest graffiti writers in the UK. You know, they're, they're a cunning bunch of wolves. Mm. I, I love them. We Fantastic. had a, a, a fun, I still know so many funny stories about that. Like, that's another podcast for later. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole different but You know, I see, I still see Carl quite a bit because I bump into him in, in Ibiza and, and uh, yeah, and I, you know, and I'm, I, and I'm in touch with Chrissy quite a lot on the internet. But those, those are the two I, I communicate with the most because mm -hmm. she just writes to me and, and Kyle I see because we hang out together there a bit. But they were great. They were, they, watching them do what they did was amazing. Northwest London has a lot of creative pockets and moments in history, hasn't it? 
I guess, yeah. Crazy when you think about the hip hop movement mm. and you know, Trellick, you know, AJ Pitt. Tracy now, you know, Tracy, Northwest 10. Yeah, yeah. AJ Tracy. Double W10, sorry. Uh, Labrick yeah. Grove, yeah. Yeah, he's W10 through and through, and him and Mabel right. are well tight, man. They're, they're popular with W10ers. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, people Great. think it's a bit whack and a bit kind of retired people, but actually the scene is quite, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a whole cool. scene going on, down, particularly around Labrick Grove and all yeah. that area. Like, new rappers, new artists. Yeah, the Maxi's there out. You know, there's like, there's a big R&B thing going on now. Mm. And then you've got, um, yeah, no, there's there's good things going on. Mm. There's good things. I just saw the specials in the studio re recording an album. That's just it's just a little bit too in, casual for in me. West it's London. Like gone where, where, how? I got, I got a phone call because they wanted Nana's to sing on a trap. But unfortunately, she couldn't do it, but she didn't have time. But, um, but so I went to see them. I saw Horace and I saw, yeah, Mad. I saw Lindell. I saw Terry. Yeah, they were all there. I was like, nothing's changed. Really? <laughs> yeah, working in the Great East Coast Studios, you know, one of the great establishments of West London. Mm. Yeah, and then Psalm's up for sale now. Is it up for sale? Yeah. Psalm is very good for those outside the um, London, uh, in, into Zone 7. Uh, Psalm is a very, very, very... Well, it used to be Basin Street Studios. The telephone yeah. number was 229-1229. Really? Yeah, that was the old Marley room. That was where, where all the Bob, great Bob Marley records were made. And then... And then, uh, then it became Trevor Horn Studio when it then it got retitled to Psalm, and then there Psalm go. got sold to build some houses, and then they put a kind of production room office building in Labrick Grove, which got called Psalm as well. And now that's up for sale. The original <sighs> one was on um, was it, you know like at, at the back of um, of Lancaster Road. Gary Barlow's got the old um, Nelly Hooper Studio just off Salisbury Road. Yeah, that's right. Isn't yeah, it? that's yeah, that's in uh, yeah. That was a den of iniquity when then yeah. it was there. I used yeah. to love that place. Yeah, yeah, man, it's tough and nice. Yeah. And yeah. Kind of, kind of, I haven't seen Nels movie. for a long time, actually. I need to see him. I haven't seen him for years. And for some reason, our paths haven't crossed. But, yeah, there's a man you should interview. Yeah, well, man. I mean, everyone you just pretty much run off there, I was just like, yeah, I'll check with Cameron about that one. Any regrets before we go? Yeah, I any wish I'd regrets? never taken drugs. I wish I'd never drunk. I wish I'd never raised my voice in anger. Um, I wish I'd been faster to learn the things that I just was spouting off about. I wish that I had, um, I wish I'd been around uh, when certain records were made just to watch. Mm. Uh, I wish my mum was still alive. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. I wish my dad was still alive. My dad died when I was 16. I miss him still, you know. Amazing man. I wish that, um, I wish that, um, I wish that Pretty Patel could learn some of the shit that we know and could mm. turn around and surprise us. Mm -hmm. I wish that Joe Biden wasn't sending all those arms to Israel because mm. that doesn't feel right. I wish that, um, I wish that, I wish that, yeah, I wish that, I wish that we had concentrated more on, on letting the world be a proper place. If you think about what Britain did when it divided up, when it partitioned India, when it gave away mm. Palestine, when it divided all of those areas, they've, we've not been great, have we? No. Though? And we don't admit to it neither a lot of times. And then as far as personal regrets, I just wish I wasn't such an asshole. <laughs> well, you ain't an asshole. I no, am. you're not. I mean, no, yeah, but I mean, yeah, we always wish we could do better and I just wish I wasn't such a tosser. I think that it's good to think that you're a tosser because that's a good place to come from. If you look in the mirror and go, you're all right, mate, you mm. know, every day and know you're all right, but then go, yeah, but you're still a cunt. You know what I mean? I mean, it's a good place. The legend. <laughs> Cameron V inside the place and brother, it's been awesome. Everything I wanted. No, oh, thank you very much. You, I, I wouldn't do this for anyone else, you know that. Yeah. I've only ever done two interviews. Uh, one was at the American M uh, Ambassador's residence for a friend of mine's who used to be one of the Sony gods. I did it for him and I really regretted it afterwards because they weren't as professional as you. Oh! <laughs> so that's true. That's not me just winding him My up. guy. So bless <laughs> you, bless you. Thank you so much for passing through. Thank you for putting up my with me. boy. Cameron, thank you so much, my brother. Listen, you know, the curse. I'm going to give it straight from the horse's mouth here. Killer Cow Podcast. Karen is sharing. Don't forget to share, all right? Spread the good word. Don't talk to anybody, I wouldn't. Stay lucky, people. It's all love. Peace. <laughs> that was good, man.